we talked and we compared and contrasted apps versus mobile websites. Um, you are, by the way, welcome to watch the videos of my mobile app development class, which is on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And um, you know, you should be able to find it if you just go to YouTube. If you look at one of my lectures, go to YouTube and look under my name, you can find those. Because we had a real similar discussion um, about that um, in class yesterday. The difference was instead of focusing on websites, we focused on the app side of things. So it'd be nice at least to watch that introductory lecture that way. You, you can get maybe the other side of the picture. And the conclusion that you should come to, all right, is that this is a real mess, all right? <laughs> because you have um, two equally, um, neither solution is with, without its issues. I'll pause for a minute to think if that is <laughs> grammatically correct, and if that says what I wanted to say or the opposite of what I wanted to say. Both sides have issues, all right? The idea, the big issue, of course, just to highlight the biggest issue with uh, mobile app development is that you have to develop for each platform specifically. All right, you can't write an app for Android and I, you know, and have it run on a uh, on an iPhone, nor vice versa. There are supposedly tools that can make that easier, but. Um, those tools are expensive, and I haven't seen them in uh, working, and therefore I'm a little skeptical. Things like that usually don't work in the best way, or don't work necessarily as well as promised. So the big issue on the app side is you have to do everything twice. The good news on the app side is you can write something, because you're doing it specifically for a device, you can write something that really works well on that device. You can make it look better because you don't have to rely on like standards like HTML. You can use the native functionality of the device to get it, you know, to get a really nice look, to make it real simple and straightforward, to integrate with everything else on the device, and so on. So, but you got to do it twice, you know. Um, the good news on the web side of things is that you only have to do it once. The bad news, or the downside of that, is number one, there are some limitations with HTML. If you're if you're doing if you're not doing a native, you might not be able to get it quite as attractive looking as you could a, a native app. It won't be optimized for a particular platform, uh, and the um, notion that oh well, you know, with a website, you just have to develop one, and you're okay. Uh, in a way, there are there's issues with that. There's issues with that because you have to run in a browser, and, and like with any website, you know, we've just upped our potential browser compatibility issues because we're not just looking at Firefox, Google Chrome, Internet Explorer. We're looking at browsers on different mobile devices as well. All right, so that kind of muddies the water um, um, as well. All right. In addition uh, to that. Um, limitations on the device, you know, the screen size, the way the user interacts with it by touching links rather than mousing to clicking it, all those things are things that imply that you might want a different look and feel on your uh, mobile website than you would on your desktop website. Now the good news is, is, is if you, if those of you that have me for CISS 216, I don't believe you did, right? You didn't have any food? Okay. Uh, you had the, the one over in Arts and Humanities, right? Uh, yeah. The, the, the web development. Yeah, what right. Um, and again, I'm not really sure how that class is structured. I imagine it's probably done in a very similar way to my class, in that the focus really is on having a very clean separation between the content of the page and the presentation. That is, the content of the page, the meaning, the semantics of the page is done via HTML. And the presentation is done in CSS, all right? And never the twain shall meet, as they say. And we'll talk a little bit more about the implications of that um, in a minute. But again, you have browser compatibility issues, the potential for that. Uh, in addition to the limitations of the device, 
smaller screen, touching rather than using a mouse, though, you know, keying uh, information in. You also have the fact that people on a mobile site are apt to have different goals than people visiting the full site. So there might be motivation, even though the promise is that you could develop something that works in both platforms, both mobile and desktop, there might still be a motivation to develop something that, uh, a different site for the mobile as opposed to the desktop. Now, there's different things that you can do, of course, to share content and to mitigate some of those, that, that designing things twice, but getting ahead of myself on that. All right, back to presentation and content. Um, again, this is a topic that I, I really try to stress in my web development classes. And um, sometimes it's not immediately apparent to students why this is so important. You know, for the projects that we do, you know, develop a web page, you know. What difference does it make to put a break tag in, for example, as opposed to using CSS to increase the margin? Well, the difference is, is the break tag is a 100% appearance re, uh, related tag. That's all it does is it puts space. It has no meaning. All right. Likewise, the center tag, if you want to center some text, use a center tag, that is 100% appearance based. All right. And we're not going to use those, all right? We're, gonna, we're not going to use those. We're only going to use HTML tags for semantic. And what do I mean? The word semantic relates to meaning as opposed to presentation. The content we're going to do in HTML as opposed to the appearance. Everything relating to appearance, we we're going to do in CSS. Everything that relates to semantic or content, logical structure goes in HTML. CSS, presentation, appearance, physical layout. This is like our starting assumption. And I'm talking about it today. My assumption is, is that you have a, at least a decent grip on what I mean about this. And if I'm not correcting that assumption, let me know. All right? That was my phone. Let me turn off the, the volume of that. Um, so that's my assumption. And my, uh, my assumption is that while you might not be perfect on that, you, you sort of at least get it in theory. All right? And if we find things in practice that we need to tweak, we'll, we'll do that. But in theory, at least, um, that's, uh, that's the way to go. All right. So, moving forward. What are things that we are not going to do then in our HTML? All right. Let's list some of them. And if you don't know about these, close your ears. Don't even, don't even hear me say that you can do this or that people have done this. All right? So, it, you know, close your ears. Things that we're not going to do. No tables for layout. That's one of the big sins of previous styles of web development. Back before CSS had widespread support, people used tables for layout. Why? Because you can make tables into a nice little grid. You know, designers love grids. So you can go and you can put a grid and you can put your logo and you can put your navigation area and so on and so forth. All right. But we're not going to do that. Why? Because that ties your appearance your physical layout to a specific look. All right? That ties it to a specific look. So, something that looks good on the desktop as a two by two grid on a little bitty mobile screen won't necessarily look.
look as good. All right, so we're not gonna we're not gonna go there. We're not gonna do that. We are not gonna use the F word at all. What is the F word? The font tag. Again, that's all appearance. Word doesn't mean different if it's in a different font. All right, that's strictly the appearance of the word. You know, if Shakespeare were a web designer, you know, a rose in Comic Sans smells just as sweet. All right, <laughs> maybe he would say, but he probably would. He probably would have came up with something better than that. We're not going to use the center tag. We're not going to put align attributes. And we're not going to use the break tag. Anything else, because this is not necessarily a comprehensive list, but anything else you should look at and ask yourself, is this really content of the page? Is this something that the person is going to the page to see? Or is this relative to the, does this relate to the appearance of the page? All right. If it relates to the appearance, it doesn't belong in HTML, even if there's a tag or attribute that does it. It belongs in CSS. All right. By logical structure, that's the one thing that is, uh, might be a little hazy. I mean separating your pages into sections like banner, navigation, content, footer, that sort of thing. That is part of the organization of the page, and in a sense, is part of the meaning of the page. That's different than the physical layout that says we have a banner and it's going to appear going down the left-hand column. All right, this is a vertical banner. Or we have navigation and it's going to go uh, on the left-hand side or the right-hand side or whatever. That's the physical layout and that's how it looks. Um, I, I often use this site as a good uh, example of some of the, the benefits of separating presentation and content. I do this in my on-campus web development class. So you probably have seen it before, but maybe not all of you have. have. And that is the CSS Zen Garden site. What the CSS Zen Garden site does is it takes a single HTML document and displays it differently using only changes to the CSS. So, if you look at this, this is the default page for CSS Zen Garden. Over here on the side are different CSS files. So this page and this page have the identical HTML. The only difference is the CSS that's applied to it. As does this page, as does this page, and so on down the line. This does a great job of showing the potential of this and the good things that can happen. All right? When you don't incorporate aspects of the appearance into HTML. Now, I kind of described the what's, the why's I've kind of implied. The why's of this are, first of all, by taking this approach, it's easy to take the same content and display it different ways, right? And that's exactly what we want to do in many cases in the mobile environment. We want to take the same content and we want to display it a couple different ways, all right? So, that's why that's a, that's a good practice for that. We might want to display it a different way if we print it as opposed to display it on the screen. You know, If we were printing this document, we might not necessarily want the fish in the background. We might just want the text, for example. All right. The other big reason is maintainability. Because we can take that CSS file, put it in, or CSS code, put it in an external file, and then we can change our entire site's look 
simply by changing the CSS. So I, I gave an example of a retail store that I did web development on where seasonally they would change their color scheme to match the colors of the season. You know, as fall approaches, it probably change their colors to, you know, oranges and reds and browns. As Christmas approached, red and green, you know, and so on down the line. All right. And it was easy to do because you just had to make the, the change in one place in that CSS file. If you did, if you did things the old school way, where you embedded code about the appearance in your HTML, you'd have to go in and redo all those pages, and that's not a good thing. Hopefully now you're convinced of this. Actually, hopefully, my hope is, is that you were convinced of this before, all right? And this is just a reminder, all right? And, and this is like the starting assumption. But if you weren't convinced before, I hope that you are now, all right? So, what are we going to do uh, now? We're going, to, we're going to follow through that practice and take one page and render it a couple different ways. And we're going to follow a formula to do that. And the formula is described in the book. Now keep in mind, this is like our first stab at this, right? So we'll expand upon some of the aspects of this formula, and the principles are pretty straightforward, and we'll work on the implementation of that. And our goal is to develop a responsive site. What do we mean by responsive? Well, what we mean by responsive is that the site knows where it's being viewed. It knows that it's being viewed on a mobile device versus a uh, desktop device. And it correspondingly makes itself look different in that environment. Now, what are the components of this? And I forgot my little iPad, so I don't have my notes. I'm going to bring them up on the, on the screen. The components of this are, first of all, We're going to use CSS3 media queries. All right. What does that mean? That's code that we're going to put into our CSS that will, how do I want to say this? Allow the browser to choose which style sheet to apply in a given situation. And those are called CSS3 media queries. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to have a fluid layout. What does that mean? We're getting rid of like anything absolute, certain number of pixels, and we're going to do things based on percentages. That should be pretty obvious, right? If we have a 320 wide screen, we want our banner to fill 320 pixels of it. We, we, we don't want a banner that's 500 pixels long that goes off the edge of the screen. All right? If it's 480, we want it to be 480 wide. So we're going to be using percentages instead of fixed. So fixed you know, can have its place in a desktop environment where you can make certain assumptions, but with the limited space and the big variance in space. And if you think about it, really, every Handheld device actually has two sets of dimensions, portrait and landscape, all right? Um, we're, we're, we're definitely motivated to use relative positioning and, and making the layouts fluid. Last but not least, we're going to do similar things with images. In other words, we're not going to put an image on the page at just a certain size. We're going to specify the size of the image fluidly, all right? Uh, based on the, on the size of the device and, and the, the size of the, the browser window. Now, what good news that we, one, one piece of good news is, is you can't resize windows typically in mobile devices. So when they open up, they open up to the full screen. So, um, you know, you don't have, 
you know, you only have two orientations to worry about. All right, I'm going to download an example, and I posted it. If I was good, I would do this every class, post the example beforehand. But obviously, I'm only good some of the time. But I was good today, and I posted it. So I'm going to pull down the example that we're going to cover today. And we're going to take a look at it. And we're going to take a look at it both in the desktop browser and using an emulator. All right. The other thing I posted today or yesterday was a link to the Opera emulator. All right. What's an emulator? What does it mean when we say uh, an, an emulator? Any ideas? Um, I don't know about general terms, but you probably can, it gives you a sense of what it's going to look like in a different Yeah. Uh, an emulator is a tool that, that simulates an environment. In other words, you know, how many mobile devices are, are, are there out there? There's a bunch of them, right? Um, pretty much, you know, no one could afford to buy one of every mobile device and test it. All right. A few people might try to prove me wrong on that. Yeah. Well, the, yeah. There, there always, there always will be those that, that that do that. Therefore, an emulator is an application that essentially imitates or emulates a particular mobile platform, and that's very useful in terms of uh, testing. Now, I will say that you shouldn't be fooled if it works in an emulator that it's going to work. Remember, this is just like a, you know, it's like a pretty good <laughs> estimate that it probably will work, you know, because especially if the emulator is good and the Opera mobile emulator is, is reportedly pretty good. Um, yeah, it'll, it'll do a good job of showing you what it's like. But remember, that's not the real environment. That's, that's a simulation of the environment. You know, just like, you know, a flight simulator might be very realistic. It might be very useful in training people how to fly. But I'm sure the actual experience of, of flying a plane is different than riding uh, uh, in, in a flight simulator. All right. I downloaded this application and... Uh, what I'm going to do is I am going to open it up and we'll look at, at the HTML code. And I'm first I'm going to I'm going to cut something out of it. Cuz I sort of have the finished uh, product one thing, by the way, um, depending on any number of factors, when I create these examples, I'm either on a Mac or a Windows machine, all right? Which means that occasionally, if I'm on a Mac when I do it and I upload it, there's some formatting issues. And I'll show you real quick how to take care of it. So if I were to open this in Notepad, you'll notice that, you know, everything gets smashed onto one line, just the way that the Mac handles carriage returns as opposed to PCs. The easiest way to fix that is to open it up in Notepad, or I'm sorry, in WordPad. WordPad. Or not. Open it up in WordPad. All right. Save it. And then when you go and open it up in a plain text editor, it'll look right. All right, there we 
go. Now, keep in mind, you know, I'm, I'm old school with this. I um, use just plain text editors for web developing. Um, and, and for this class, you know, and many of my other classes, I just open things up in Notepad or, um, I, I, you know, in the lab there's Notepad++ and there's, there's a number of other simple text editors. But I don't open something in Dreamweaver or something like that because, again, in my mind, um, I know I can code something better and more efficient and better code than what Dreamweaver by dragging and dropping is liable to generate. So I do a lot of the hand coding for this. At any rate, I'm going to go and I'm going to remove this link to the CSS file for now. All right, And we're going to look at this page both within the emulator and within a regular browser. All right, So here is the page. All right. Keep in mind, I don't necessarily, um, you know, my examples are meant to illustrate things as opposed to uh, being, you know, elaborate and, and perfect. But this is a page that opens up in a desktop window. I'm going to make, I'm going to change the CSS real quick because I did this in my, uh, office, and I'm going to make the container a little smaller. Just so that we can maybe see the little background image. Yeah, or not. choose whether you want it oriented, uh, tested oriented um, landscape or, or portrait. So you could test it both ways to get a, a sense of how that looks. So I'm going to keep it at portrait. Now once you do that, then you can go and you can browse the web via a mobile device or, or pretend to do it via a mobile device. All right. There's Google on a mobile device. Here's our website as emulated on this. Kind of hard to read. All right. Let's look at my page now. Now keep in mind this is my page without any accommodation to, uh, of, the, uh, of the mobile device. This is just my desktop layout as viewed in a mobile device. Oops, wrong file. All right, not very good. All right, not not particularly easy to read and good. And you know, I have three columns here. All right, probably a better approach is you know, for many mobile websites, is instead of having 